Bill Umber with you again, and this is our Green Citizen program campaign that we're working on at Seneca College. Today we want to look at uh, aspects of the built environment, but aspects of the built environment that weren't built. What goes into the conceptualization of projects? Why do some projects happen and others not happen? Today I have with me Mark Osbaldeston, who is the author of two incredible books on the Toronto that wasn't built, Unbuilt Toronto and Unbuilt Toronto Two, both published by Dundurn. Mark, good to have you with us today. Thank you very much, Bill. Tell us a little bit about Unbuilt Toronto. Why did these projects, why were they imagined? What was the thinking behind them? And in some cases, why did they never happen? All kinds of different reasons. And that's the fascinating thing. When you look at these projects, it's really an insight into the city at different stages of its development. Um, the economics, the politics, some of the colorful characters that were around in the day, even the good or bad luck that uh, was befalling the city at any given time. And here, standing at Nathan Phillips Square in City Hall, which is iconic for the city, it's the perfect spot for this topic because we're surrounded by the ghosts of these mm. projects that, that never happened. Um, just in this stretch of Queen Street between Young Street and University Avenue, there's all kinds of projects that either we would have, wouldn't have recognized because they came out of a very different way or that didn't happen at all. And the, as I said, the City Hall is a perfect example. It's synonymous with the city, and Nathan Phillips Square is in many ways the heart of the city. But it was on the drawing boards, as I found out, in one form or another, for 50 years before mm. it actually opened. And it's almost actually 50 years ago that this building did open. And the interesting thing to me is when I was doing the research is we tend to think that, well, the square is just, it's the front yard of the building, so it's kind of the afterthought, nice little add on. But in reality, the square was always mm. what people were planning from the beginning. They thought there might be a building here, maybe there wouldn't, but if there was, maybe it would be a city hall, maybe it would be a courthouse, maybe it would be uh, police headquarters. All of these were proposed, but it was the square that really got things going uh, as far back as before the First World War. Um, and, but originally, people weren't sure where the square should go. If we just over a little farther to our west, there's Old City Hall, and it's a beautiful building. It's looking better now than it has in years because it's been restored. But it lacks one thing that city halls typically have, and that is a square in front of it. And as the building neared completion in 1899, people realized that. And there were two petitions in front of city hall to rectify that situation. The problem was there's not a lot of space between Queen Street and the building, so what do you do? So the proposal was to cross Queen and have the city hall square di directly across Queen in front of that old city hall. And as I said, there were two petitions at the time. One of them was from the foresters <laughs> who built Toronto's first skyscraper, which is now demolished, which <laughs> was just kitty corner to Old City Hall. So they had an interest, obviously, in having a nice square there. Another reason, you know, looking at the unbuilt things, we learn sometimes about the things that we actually had and, and were demolished. Um, so there was a lot of debate about building this square, and people thought it would be too small. There were cost overruns on Old City Hall, so people thought, we can't afford to have a frill like a square. Um, and what ended up happening was the Globe newspaper mm. at the time said, if you're gonna build a square, we wouldn't build it south of Queen. We would build it in the area between what's now Old City Hall and Osgoode Hall, just over to our west. Because then what you'll have is you'll have two grand civic buildings, the Old City Hall and Osgoode Hall, and they will bookend this new civic space. Mm. And it's that idea that really stuck in the public imagination and decades later mm. resulted in the construction of Nathan Phillips Square. Mm. Um, so what happened eventually is they had a, a plebiscite or a referendum in 1947 and the voters of Toronto were asked if they would give their permission for the city to start acquiring property in the area where we're now standing. But significantly, as I said, there was no mention of a city hall. It was mm. for a public square. Part of the reason was, as I said, they didn't know if they were, they knew they needed more city space for city staff, but they didn't know if it was gonna, they were gonna go here or if they could sort of finagle more space out of the old building. So it was, the question was silent on that. Mm. Uh, but different plans started uh, to develop. Harkening back to, as I said, even around the First World War, there was a proposal for something uh, called a civic center. Um, and believe it or not, it was spurred by the World's Fair in Chicago mm. in 1893. And you wouldn't think that a World's Fair 
would have an effect on the city planning of Toronto, but it did, in fact. And not only on the city planning of Toronto, but on the city planning of cities across North America, including specifically many of the Great Lakes cities around us, like Buffalo, Cincinnati, Columbus, Chicago. Because it spurred something called the City Beautiful Movement. Mm. This was a time when North American cities were very prosperous. They were really rivaling their European uh, counterparts as far as wealth. But people looked around and they sure weren't rivaling them as far as beauty. Mm. They sure weren't rivaling them as far as the, uh, uh, the splendor of the civic space. So the City Beautiful movement, which came out of this exposition in Chicago, it attempted to rectify that with grand public buildings whose, whose purpose would be to awe people and to really give them a sense of uh, of the splendor of uh, the, the civic government and the civic realm. And one of the things that, uh, one of the sort of things out of the standard City Beautiful planning playbook was something called a civic center. And this was a formal arrangement of public buildings placed around a public square. And the idea of that was that you would have three public buildings in this spot and they would connect with the Grand Boulevard down with the new Union Station, which hadn't been built yet. So you'd have you'd get out of the train at Union Station, which would be the symbolic entryway to this, not only symbolic, mm. but the actual, and many, for many people, entryway into the city. And you would see this grand boulevard leading mm. up to this beautiful civic space. The tragedy of that idea, and it was, it was actually published in 1911 by uh, a group called the Civic Improvement uh, Commission. Union Station was built where it was supposed to go. And if you look at an aerial map today, you'll see that Union, the front door of Union Station is in an access with Nathan Phillips Square. Mm. So Union Station went where it was supposed to go. Nathan Square ultimately went where it was supposed to go. But the city didn't protect the right of way for that Grand mm. Boulevard. The interesting thing is many private developers and building anticipated this Grand Boulevard. So for example, the Royal York, when it was built, its eastern wall was meant to flank mm. on this new road. Uh, there's another building down on uh, Shepherd, just south of us, called the Graphic Arts Building, which was also meant to flank on this new road. But the, the right of way was never preserved. There was an attempt in 1929 to revive the plan. Uh, it again went to the voters who voted it down. The problem was you have the Great Depression, so you can see mm -hmm. how economics play into this. And also, frankly, I think a feeling of parochialism, and by that I mean people out in the neighborhood saying, you know, our roads have potholes, we don't mm -hmm. have good transit service, why are we building these grand boulevards that really aren't going to do much to move traffic or kind of ameliorate any of the other congestion problems? Almost. The more things change, the more they stay the Absolutely. same. Absolutely. So it's in interesting politics. to me to see some of these, uh, some of these debates come back and back yeah. again. In fact, even you, you know, you say that the debate that happened here a few months ago about subways versus mm. LRTs. Right. That same debate was happening in the 1915 mm. era too. Uh, people were proposing subways. People were proposing rapid transit. Would have been streetcars mm. in their own rights away. So, I you know, 100 years later, I think it's it's pretty fascinating. Yes. Yeah, and instructive in that sense. So it wasn't built. What was built in its place? So what happened was, as I said, you have uh, the voters voted down the proposal in 1929 uh, uh, for the road. But I said in 1947, they approved the acquisition of land for the square. And pretty soon after that, the city staff uh, started to get busy on proposals for a city hall. And there were various proposals, which I show in the first Unbuilt Toronto book. Uh, uh, and one, particularly uh, in the 1950s, caused a lot of public uproar. What, what City Council did, did was they asked three local firms to collaborate on a proposal for a new city hall in this location, which they did. Uh, to say that it didn't receive a warm welcome is a bit of an <laughs> understatement. All three years at the School of Architecture at U of T condemned it. Um, there was a lot of, uh, they even got uh, Walter Gropius, the founder of the Bauhaus architectural movement, to chime in and condemn it. They mm. got uh, Frank Lloyd Wright to condemn it. I shouldn't say that, not that, not that the students did, mm -hmm. but, uh, uh, but others opposed to the proposal did. And if you look at it now, and I, I show the image in the book, uh, it's hard to know what the fuss was about because it's a very mm. elegant building, mm. very similar to uh, other commercial, high quality commercial office towers being proposed at the time. Mm -hmm. In fact, if anyone's familiar with the Imperial Oil Headquarters, the former headquarters at St. Clair between Young and Avenue Road, that building is almost mm. identical in many ways to the proposed City Hall here, minus the podium where the council chamber would go. And it was, in fact, built around, around the same time by one of the firms who was collaborating. And we look at it now, and it's a great looking building. It's covered in limestone, high quality mm. materials. You wouldn't see it really duplicated today mm. because of the expense. But the problem was, the citizens of Toronto in this period 
in this sort of dynamic post-war period, we're not looking for polite corporate architecture pressed into mm. public service. They were looking for a building that expressed its function as the democratic mm. center of mm. the city. That's a high order, uh, yeah. but you can see what they got did yeah. that. It, no one would confuse this for a bank tower. Right. No one would confuse this for an insurance company headquarters. Right. So they, it was a good result. And what happened was that backlash saw the city, in fact, go out with a competition, right. which blew everyone away, the response. Um, over 500 entries from 42 different countries, a really unbelievable response. Mm. All kinds of different proposals, and it was a Finnish architect, Vilja Revel, who, uh, who was the winner here. So mm. again, for Toronto, which, you know, in many ways, it was started as a British colonial outpost, people think of it as conservative. This was a big step forward to pick this European architect mm -hmm. to do this very not Toronto-like building at right. the time, which looks modern today. 50 mm -hmm. years late, 50, almost 50 years after yeah. it opened, this building looks modern still. Yeah, yeah. I remember the first time I saw it as a teenager and was just overwhelmed by it. It was so different from anything else that was in the city of Toronto at that time. It really was, and it really shows you, when you know the backstory to it, the fact that an office tower looking building was proposed, you know why the citizens were ready for something different. Sure. So it, it, looking at the unbuilt things really helps you understand a lot of the built environment yeah. as well. Um, an interesting story, I show there were eight finalists in this competition. Right. And this was the winner, obviously, this building here. If you look at the seven runners up, none of them look like this. Huh. They tend to be um, low rise, right. which I think is a reaction to the fact that people knew they weren't supposed to, or the, the judges were not looking for a typical commercial office tower. They tend to have courtyards in the middle. They tend to have lots of trees down at the south end because the south end of Queen, again, learning, looking into the history, you see, was pretty shabby at that time. Yeah. So there's an attempt to obscure that. And I suspect that part of what Revel did with this walkway was achieve the same thing with a, with a, a different means. Now, what about old City Hall? Because weren't there plans to do away with it or essentially yeah. remove everything but the tower? What happened with that story? Well, what happened was at the time that the judging was going on for new City Hall, the city planners went to Eaton's, who were located down uh, here just across Bay, and said, we're going to be proposing the redevelopment of this whole giant block just to the west of you. We think it would be great if you would do something to redevelop on the other side mm. of Bay. Now, it so happened that Eaton's had been thinking of something along these lines for many years, but with this green light from the city, they really threw it into high gear. Um, and they started to amass all the land between mm. Dundas and Queen and Young and Bay. They didn't get it all, particularly on the Young side, Young and Dundas, they didn't get it all. But they came forward with a proposal to City Council or Metro Council, as, as it actually was at the time, um, in 1965, for a proposal that blew everyone away. Five office towers, uh, well, office and residential, three of them would have immediately been the highest buildings in the Commonwealth. Mm. 200 store mall with a seven story atrium would have been the largest retail complex in the world at the time. Vast open plaza, all the buildings gone, uh, including Old City Hall, mm -hmm. as you alluded to. All that was going to be left was the bell tower. Mm. And the cenotaph, actually, the war cenotaph would have been yeah. left as well, surrounded by this plaza. And the reason was that Eaton's planners, they called Old City Hall an insuperable barrier. That was the phrase that mm. they used. They said, if you don't get rid of Old City Hall, there's not going to be an Eaton Center because we need this connection to the top of Bay. It's a prime location. I mean, the reason that City Hall was built there is the same reason that anyone would want to build there because it's just, it's the top of the financial district. It's in a city that is built on a, a military grid. We don't have a lot of streets which terminate in a grand vista. Right. That is one of the ones that does. So, mm. uh, because of just the, the vagaries of uh, the way the grid was was laid out. So it was a great location. Um, and the, the interesting thing is we came very close to losing that building because Metro Council was in favor of, of selling it. Actually, it was going to be a long-term lease. City Council was in favor of selling it. All three dailies, there were three uh, dailies in Toronto at the time, were in favor of selling it. The only thing that was holding things up was the price, yeah. the, the price for the lease. And so negotiations went on for a year. But an interesting thing happened, and in fact, during that year, the city planners got a bit concerned about, well, won't those buildings cast a shadow on Nathan mm. Phillips Square? And so what a lot of people actually forget now 
is that Eaton said, okay, we can lower one of the buildings, but we're going to have to make up the density somewhere. So in the final proposal for that 1960s Eaton Center, even the clock tower was going to go. Mm. There'd be nothing left. Holy Trinity Church is the only thing that would have been mm. left on that, on that block that we would recognize today. So what happened was, though, in this period when the negotiations were going on, some citizens started to organize. Uh, a group formed called Friends of Old City Hall. They started to write letters. They showed up at council meetings. They wrote letters to the newspapers. And in one brilliant move of public activism, what they did was because that building at the time was covered in soot, Old City Hall right. was. They showed up with scrub brushes and pails with soapy water, and they actually started to scrub the wow. grime off that building. So people could see the beautiful stonework, the multicolored wow. stonework there. And we can see it now because mm -hmm. it's been restored. So it started to draw some attention to the fact that maybe it's not a good idea to tear this building down. Now, interestingly, uh, in, the, at, in 1967, Eaton's dropped a bombshell and they walked away from the mm. proposal. Part of the, uh, the uh, public outcry against the demolition had something to do with it, because obviously as a company that relies on the public goodwill, more interested in being um, uh, thought about in connection with the Santa Claus parade than tearing down a, a mm. public building, this had an impact. But, but really what, what did it in, I think, in the end was the economics. Mm. They had to either occupy themselves or lease out 11 million square feet mm. of space over there. And at this, by the time they walked away from it, um, the TD Center is now under construction. The Bank of Commerce says that they're going to be building an office tower down there. So it's clear that King and Bay is going mm. to be really continue to be the place where prestige office buildings are going to be. Mm. They're not going to be at Dundas and Young. So economics, at the end of the day, probably had a greater role than the, the desire to save Old City Hall. But in the reality is, they were back to the drawing board a year later. And of course, we ended up with an Eaton Center, which is mm -hmm. itself now an iconic building or an mm -hmm. iconic uh, structure in this city and we got old city hall looking better than ever and the irony as i always say is this building that they said was an insuperable barrier mm. is here looking better than ever as we stand here now and eaton's is of course just a, mm. a memory historical footnote marvelous way of looking at our built environment mark uh, when you look back on it and and you look at it as a dip dispassionate citizen of toronto today are we better off are we worse off or is it indifferent? What, what, what's your kind of lasting observation on the city of Toronto that, that exists well, today? It's a great question. And I think it's why the topic is so fascinating because I think people can have different views. You know, well-meaning people, well-informed people can have different views on some of these things. Mm. So in the book, I don't sort of tip my hand a lot uh, about what my particular view is. Though when I speak, I do. I mean, obviously I think it would have been a tragedy to lose old city hall. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the takeaways are different for, for each of the projects mm -hmm. and maybe for each of the people. But I think the one takeaway that you can take from all of these proposals is that the city doesn't just happen. I think sometimes we look at the city and we say, well, this is the way Toronto looks because this is the way Toronto looks. How yeah. could it have looked any other way? We're Toronto. Yeah. We look at Chicago. Well, it's Chicago it looks the way Chicago looks. That's Chicago. But you know, we're both Great Lakes cities. Mm -hmm. The fact that they have the, this parkland along the water and we don't, those are the, we started off with the same, you know, sort of situation geographically, different results because of decisions we make mm. along the way. We actually had our waterfront in a trust long before Chicago ever did, but we made the decision to hand it over to the railways. Mm. And we've been trying to get it back ever since. And, and in fact, right now, as the railways disappear, decisions are being made on the waterfront, which will affect the shape of the city for a century, two centuries, three centuries. I mean, you take the long view. Right. So I don't think it's a hyperbole to say that because yeah. You know, some of these uses get in and they don't go away. So we really are, are um, we really are at a watershed now, no pun intended, where for areas like the waterfront, the decisions are being made. So I think that that's the takeaway from my book, to just really focus in on how important these decisions are and to get involved and to know that you, the system is set up for public participation. Uh, but, you know, if the public doesn't get involved, it doesn't work the way it should. So I, I hope that's a takeaway that people will have from the books. Mark, I want to thank you for this. It's been a spectacular overview of the city that it's always in process. It's always being created. Maybe that's the, the way we need to think about it. Absolutely. Is, that's something that it, engages all of us in that conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Great to have you with us. Thanks.